Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Growing Intuitive Eaters podcast. Today, I have Laura from the Butterfly OT on. She is an expert um, OT chatting, and we're going to be chatting about tantrums versus meltdowns, sensory sensitivity, sensory processing disorder. She's also a mama to a sweet little peanut. She's on Instagram, too. So I'll let her give her her background and introduce herself a little bit more, and then we will get to chatting. So Laura, thank you for being here, and welcome. Thanks, Taylor. I was excited to get this invite. I love talking all things sensory processing, and I really love teaching parents about it because it's something that I feel like recently is a buzzword, but parents and teachers and non-OTs really don't know the scope of sensory. And when I get to see those light bulbs go off, uh, well, whether I get to see it or hear from it after they watch something or read something, I'm like, yes, I'm so glad that you, you got that nugget, that golden nugget. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit about me. My name is Laura. I am in Southern California. I have a daughter who is, she'll be four, uh, next month in like a few weeks, actually the beginning of July. And, um, she has sensory processing disorder and I'll share a little bit about that today. And she has anxiety. So I very much am her own OT, but I always try to struggle between the mom and OT. Mm. I feel like I can't always be a hundred percent in both. And lately I've been taking off my therapist hat and trying to just be mom with her, which is hard because I can't, can't turn it off. But my clinical experience, my professional experience is I've worked in a private based clinic, a sensory integration clinic, where I work mostly with kids ages three to about 12 on, um, on a scope of things. Uh, Sensory processing is one of them, but we also work on your typical fine motor, like handwriting skills that you see a lot of OTs work on, but also gross motor, social skills, cognitive skills, whatever is really important to that child and how it impacts their ability to function at home, at school, or in the community. And I help them build those skills or help their parents adapt certain tasks or environments so that the child can be more independent. That's so interesting. I feel like not a lot of people know that OTs do all of those things. Yeah, frequently it's like OTs, especially when you talk about pediatrics, people think OTs just work a lot on uh, handwriting, especially if you're talking about like school OTs. Uh Um, So yeah, it's always a big mystery whenever, whenever people start figuring out OT, they're like, what exactly is OT? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So did you have all this interest in sensory s- processing disorder, sensory sensitivity before you had your daughter? Well, I was an OT before I had my daughter. So yes. I had been working and interning in the sensory world for okay. a couple of years before she was here. But before that, when I even was going to grad school for OT, I didn't know that I even wanted to work with kids. Oh. I wasn't, I wasn't sold. I wasn't sure. I was still exploring. So when you go to grad school for OT, you basically get like a general education. And um, if anybody's out there listening to this and you don't know that OTs can work with uh, people across the lifespan. So there's OTs in the NICU for like brand new itty bitty babies. And there's OTs that work in hospice for end of life care, um, older adults and everything in between. So uh, when you get your master's in OT, it's a general, you get like a class and like every every lifespan, every Hmm. age, every range, and like the most common disabilities and disorders that you would find with them. Um, You can get like certifications after on a special niche, but um, I didn't know, I didn't always know I wanted to work with kids in general. And it's just recently that I've been hyper-focused on sensory because it's just so relevant to my daily life. I can't stop thinking about it. So I like spew it on social media and people like it. So yeah, (laughs) so I just keep sharing. That's how I found you on social media, because I, my daughter doesn't, hasn't been diagnosed with sensory processing disorder. And you can share a little bit more about how it's not like an official DSM diagnosis, but she has sensory sensitivities. She's like a seeker in some areas and an avoider in some areas. And we worked with an OT, but man, we struggled with her behavior for a while before I finally reached out for help. And do you feel like that's something that is common in this world of sensory needs where like, you know, people just told me, oh, she's just a, a like terrible twos and it's it, nor- meltdowns are normal and tantrums happen with kids and you're just, you know, being sensitive to it. Do you hear that story a lot? 
I do. And I, I, and I saw it myself as a first time parent. And again, my expertise was in like the three and older. So that like one to three toddler age, when you hear about the terrible twos and you see them happening and it's your first child, I was like, Oh, is this what they're talking about? Like, is this the terrible twos? Is this what's happening? And, and so even as an OT, I was questioning, what is this? Is this a sensory thing? Or is this a typical two-year-old thing because that that specifically the two-year-old the two to three-year-old range when they're starting to have more autonomy on what they can say and what they can say no to and have more language coming out um a lot of it can can really look like it's just typical toddler stuff but it's really hard to tease it apart um when i find it becoming clearer to parents when they start seeking help usually around the three to four age is when they're in preschool, they're playing with more friends, their, um, their meltdowns are lasting longer, um, their parents are, are able to see it in comparison to other peers a little bit more, whether that's in play dates or at school and you're getting feedback from teachers. Um, and then at that age, then parent kind of in hindsight, they're like, oh yeah, she did do that at two and at one. And, and then it starts to fit a pattern. And then you have a clearer picture, but when you're going through it and it's in that age, it's really, really tricky to know unless it's so extreme. Um, but if you're in the field and you kind of know what sensory is, you're already starting to have that like back and forth conversation in your head. Whereas a parent who doesn't even know what sensory is would definitely just think it's their child having typical tantrums, which are normal, but certain meltdowns. And certain behaviors are definitely more in the like uh, needs more support side of, you know, the spectrum of behaviors. Um, but a lot of the time, parents who don't understand that there are there could be sensory components, there could be other things to it, might not get or look for help until like the three to four age. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now on that note for parents who like, maybe they're listening to this podcast and they've never heard of sensory sensitivity or sensory needs, or, or maybe they've heard the buzzword, but like, don't really have the details on it. Can you give us the 411 for the basics of sensory? Yes. Needs? Yes. All right. So I always start this kind of basic introduction to, I like parents to think and understand that sensory is all around us at all times. Like we live in a sensory world and we are all currently right now in this very moment, everyone is, everyone's body and brain is processing sensory input. We are all sensory processing individuals. Now here's an example. So I'm sitting in front of a bright light. I'm taking in that visual input. I am sitting cross-legged in my computer chair and I can feel my foot touching the shelf. I can feel the, the computer chair underneath my bottom. So that is tactile, which is touch input. It's also a little of proprioceptive input, which is heavy work. It's telling my muscles and tendons and joints where they are. So I know I'm cross-legged. I don't have to look to see it. I can feel it. My brain knows this. I can hear some footsteps in the background. That's my auditory sense. There's all these things that are just all around me. My, my chair kind of moves side to side. That's my vestibular sense telling me I'm moving and I don't need to see my chair moving to know it. That all my brain is doing this processing and labeling and telling me what it is automatically. I don't have to uh, consciously uh, expend effort thinking, oh, that's light. Oh, those are footsteps. Oh, my chair is moving. I'm just able to focus on you and have this conversation. Think of my words and keep focusing. That's my brain processing things automatically. That is sensory processing. And we do this daily, right? If we had to look every time the AC went on or the refrigerator did a humming sound, if we had to um, look and find what everything is, that would mean our sensory processing system is not as automatic. It's automatic because it saves our energy so that if we hear a fire alarm or if we heard the hissing of a snake, we would know we need to turn. We're like, that's different. I need to look at that because my body could be in danger, right? Or that is really hot. I need to pay attention to that so I don't touch it. Your brain knows what you can filter out and what's important to pay attention to. And right now I need to pay attention to this conversation to Taylor if I'm looking forward. So a child with sensory processing difficulties, whether it's 
sensitivity or seeking, which I'll explain in a little bit is they have like, I, I call it inefficient processing. Their brain is thinking too hard. If their brain is calling too much attention to things that aren't really relevant. So sensory sensitive child will hear every single sound and, and their brain will not understand what it is, or they might, their brain might label it as dangerous. So the sound of a blender, they might think like, that's really dangerous. I need to cry. I need to move. I need to hit something. I need, they treat it as if it were the sound of a hissing snake where you need to like run away from it or panic, whatever your fight or flight is. Same thing with, um, with sometimes sights or smells, their brain is not telling them that you, you can ignore this. Your brain, their brain is kind of having them think about every little thing that they hear, smell, touch, taste, move, a lot of things. And it takes a lot of energy for their brain to do that. So when your brain is spending energy on things that should be automatic, it's not going to have the, the time, the energy, the resources to spend on like controlling your hitting or to be able to focus on having a conversation or to be able to learn an academic task and remember your ABCs. All of those things that are higher level processing that we need our brain to focus on, there's no time for it because it's focusing on surviving. It's using a lot of the automatic energy to pay attention to things. So that's sensory sensitivity, right? So they, they have a low threshold, meaning they notice certain sensory inputs at a much higher and maybe more intense rate than you are on. So um, when I talk about sensory profiles, I like to talk about the sensory cup. So if you have- I love that analogy, by the way. It's so good. Check out her Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I have a few reels that, de that demonstrate this really well. So uh, if you have a small sensory cup, think about your sensory cup as like your nervous system, your brain. Um, and it's like how much you can tolerate, right? And then every sensory input that you get throughout your day is a drop in the sensory cup. So most of us neurotypical adults who don't have sensory processing issues have an average sized cup. We can see bright lights, we could see the sun, we could hear the blender in the morning, we could hear uh, someone sneeze, we can um, tolerate a car ride, we can tolerate spinning in a computer chair. A child who's sensory sensitive might have a small sensory cup. And I even say my daughter has like a symbol, like she gets so overstimulated very easily. So like, if you think about your morning routine, like opening the blinds brings in bright light and then washing their face, that water on their skin, those are all drops in their cup. And when the cup is overflowing, that's when you see big behaviors, big meltdowns. Um, big reactions that to us make no, that might make not make sense or feel like it's out of nowhere. Like when you come home from school and you give them a snack and they complain it's on the blue plate instead of the green plate. Well, it's not about the plate. It's about their cup is overflowing from school because they've tolerated a lot. Like the school is full of sensory input. It's a lot to be bombarded with all at once. And then you pick them up and they melt down, right? Um, so on the other side, the, the high threshold kids have like a very large sensory cup. So they don't register the sensory input at the same frequency that we do. And definitely not the same as a kid with a small sensory cup. So just as I said, an overflowing cup is a dysregulated child, an empty cup is also dysregulated. You kind of want it like somewhere in the middle. So a sensory seeker is a child who has a high threshold, a big, big, big sensory cup, and you just cannot get it full. Sometimes we say there's a hole in it. Like the more you fill it, it just keeps going. And you're like, how is this kid spinning and spinning and spinning? Or like, how can they like, um, be screaming at the top of their lungs? And like, they can't understand that their volume is too loud. Like they just aren't registering it. <laughs> and um, so it's the same thing. Their brain might not hear certain sounds. So they're not perceiving danger. Like maybe they might not notice if you're calling them like, hey, run, there's a bear. Like they might not hear that, right? In the everyday world, in the classroom, it might be them missing their name or saying, don't touch that. And they can't hear it. They can't process it. That maybe there's a delay. There's a lot of different profiles that you can have, but it all comes back to how they are taking in all of the senses in the environment and what their brain does with it. Sometimes they over respond 
which is a small sensory cup. So sensitive kids, sometimes they under respond, um, which is a big cup. And then sometimes they like seek it out. Like you cannot stop these kids from touching something if they want to get the feel of it. Like there are kids who roll in the sand. There are kids who will like paint their body with like shaving cream or anything messy because they love that feeling. So it can look very different in each child. And then the last thing I'll say is the, the question that I always get as a follow-up is, can my child have both size cups? Yes, um, but we typically call that a mixed threshold. So you can be mixed threshold in the same sensory domain. So you can have a small sensory cup for like messy play, like shaving cream and paint and slime and Play-Doh, but you might have a big sensory cup and can't get enough of like um, cuddles and like big bugs, which is some, which is a different kind of touch, but they're both touch, right? You can also have mixed threshold across domains. So you can have a large sensory cup for movement and love spinning and hanging upside down and twirling and going fast, um, but have a small sensory cup for sound or for touch. So, so many different profiles you can like mix and match. Um, I promise you I've probably seen it all, but there's like literally if you calculated, like, do you remember, like there's like a math formula where you put like the ex exponential, like you see how many, how many different combinations you could have of something. There's like six, I think different sensory profiles, three different sensory profiles, but like across six domains. If you like put that in the calculator, it's like millions of different combinations you can have. So it's not always just sensitive to sound and then you're sensitive to everything. It can like, it can look so different. Right, right. So for example, my daughter is sensitive to sound. She's an avoider for sound. She's an avoider for textures, but she's a seeker for um, like vestibular input and movement. Like she could jump onto the nugget and crash into her pillows and spin on her swing like all day long, but she will flail her hands around like nobody's business. If she touches rice, if her shirt gets wet, if she's really upset about it. So yeah, it's really interesting how you can have that mixed threshold. Did she have a lot of um, ear infections when she was little? Yes. Yes. So my daughter had, so she was born with a laryngeal cleft, which caused her to have aspiration, which we actually didn't get diagnosed till 15 months. I'm going to do a whole episode on this, but she had frequent upper respiratory infections. Like we would have a respiratory infection and then we'd have three healthy days. And then we would have a respiratory infection for like six months in a row. Like she was constantly wow. sick. And because of that, she had constant ear infections. And then you posted about there being a link and my mind was blown. Yeah. Yeah. So the vestibular input is, so vestibular is one of the senses that you don't really hear about. We always think about like the five, right? Like sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, but there's three extra ones and vestibular is one of the other ones that unless you're like in the field, you don't really walk around like knowing like the pediatrician doesn't ask like, Hey, how's your vestibular sense? Right. <laughs> but it's like a, um, the receptors for the vestibular sense is in your inner ear. And this is what tells your brain, like where your head is in space, specifically your head, because it's in your inner ear. So this is like when you're on an airplane and the shutters are down and you know that you're tilting to the right, even without seeing the horizon, like you have no point of reference, you're in this tube, right? right. But you can, your vestibular sense is activated and telling you that you're tilting to the side. It tells you when your head is upside down, it tells you when your head is spinning, it tells you how fast you're going, how slow you're going. Um, and because it's in your inner ear, it's very linked to your auditory sense. So a lot of kids with chronic ear infection have um, some sensory challenges with both auditory and vestibular. And sometimes it's sensitive to auditory and seeking movement. Sometimes it's seeking auditory and sensitive to movement. It can look different in every kid, but the idea is that your inner ear and the, uh, the, um, the way that they're, the, the hair follicles and the receptors are, they've been impacted on a physical level from the liquid in the ear. Sometimes if you have blue ear and it's like really, it really forms the, the vestibular receptors at like in a different way. And so they're processing vestibular input in a very different way. Um, but it's impacted because 
so interesting. With the ear infection. Is there yeah. any research on that? Is that more like anecdotal that a lot of clinicians are seeing? Well, there's definitely, there's definitely research. Um, I don't have any off the top of my head because we do know, like if you just see the anatomy of the ear and how, when the liquid moves as you're, as you're tilting and you see how it activates and goes into all the different canals. Um, and then you see what it looks like in a child who has an ear infection. And then you mm -hmm. can see how that like, um, prohibits the way that liquid moves and, and all the different ways that it can look. Um, those are like the harder research articles to read because they're very, they're very like anatomical and even the words, but um, there's definitely documented cool. um, ear infections and um, an increase in vestibular challenges. And a lot of kids who get ear tubes put in. Yep. My um, daughter has on her yeah, second set. <laughs> she's on her second set. A lot of them after they fall out, parents notice like some sort of decrease. And like, if they had vestibular challenges before, like they start to see it improve um, a lot of times. That was one of the research articles I read. If I try, if I find it, I'll try to. Um, oh yeah. That'd be great. Too. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now your specialty, well, I don't, I, you have to tell me if this is one of your specialties, but I asked you to talk about Ta uh, tantrums versus meltdowns. And the reason why I really wanted you to touch on this one, because you shared about it on Instagram and I like totally resonated with, with what you were talking about. But in my experience, I feel like my toddler's meltdowns were brushed off because like by my parents, which were of course, well-intentioned, you know, not like, like, it's not a bad intent. I think when people say, Oh, that's just normal. Like toddlers have tantrums, but for somebody who isn't experiencing that with their kid or hasn't like they don't comprehend the hour plus long meltdowns or like almost throwing up or injuring them. like you know things like that aren't typical for for tantrums but when you just say like my toddler's having a meltdown most people don't really understand that if they're not experiencing it so can you share the difference from a mama perspective and an OT and maybe give some tips on like how to identify it and then what to do, what to do if a mom is listening to this or a dad and feels like, oh, maybe my toddler is having more meltdowns and tantrums. That was a lot of questions. Yes. Oh no. Like I will, I will cover all of it in my, my spiel because okay. I love talking about this. This is something I'm very passionate about because as you said, there, I, there's still not a lot of, depends on the, on the professional you ask. Um, some professionals don't see the need to differentiate between the two. A lot of like the, uh, the OTs, behaviorists, um, teachers that I've spoken to, they do inherently believe there's a difference. Some psychologists, some, um, yeah, it's mostly psychologists that I've spoken to are like 50, 50 on differentiating it. But I find that it's really important because, when you understand and you are identifying your child as having a true meltdown, which I'll go into detail, but when you, when you realize that, that's more of a cause to seek professional support versus like, this is typical tantrums because the tantrums are a healthy part of development, especially in the one to three range. Every child should, I think there was a research study that said like 79%, something in the seventies of parents um, reported having tantrums. And I think that's really low. I, I like, I would love to see a parent who's say, saying that they're not witnessing. Yeah, 20%. What? I'm like, how is there, how, how, like, I would say that that's almost like not healthy because it is a healthy part of development and part of the developmental stages of a child to be able to outwardly express their anger, their frustration, their wanting of something when they don't have the language yet, which is usually in the one to three range and they're crying about it and they want it and they're stomping their feet. Um, and yes, there's a range of intensities for tantrums, but, um, but it's healthy and it's normal. And I think, I think a lot of the culture these days as parents, as we're shifting more to like the gentle parenting, mm -hmm. and the conscious parenting, I've heard from a lot of parents who just say, well, I always call it a meltdown because I feel like tantrum is negative or it's saying my kid's a brat. Like they don't like the, the phrase temper mm -hmm. tantrum. They think it's like invalidating their child's feelings. They, they just have a negative connotation. So they're like, I just call it all meltdowns because I feel like calling it a tantrum is, is harsh. And I, I see what they mean by that. Um, but the problem is, again, if you are not differentiating between a tantrum and a meltdown, then like my example is always 
I would share my daughter like, oh, she had another meltdown this morning because of, um, because she didn't want to wear like these shoes. And then a, a, a friend of mine was like, oh, we had a meltdown like that the other day too. Like it was like, a, it was five minutes of screaming and crying. And then they got in the car. I'm like, yeah, I see you mean well to try to, you know, uh, commiserate with me. I was like, but that's not a meltdown. But because I know that, right. So I'm thinking of other parents who don't know the difference and they keep hearing, oh, well, all of these other moms also hand, deal with meltdowns. So it must be normal. So I'm not going to ask my child's doctor about it. So I'm not going to seek support because I guess this is just normal. So I just have to suck it up. That's how I feel. So that's, so. that's where I feel really for parents. I'm like, no, there's something else going on. It's not that person's meltdown. It's not your meltdown. That is a tantrum. This is a meltdown. I'm going to show kind of the difference. I'll explain my like loose definition. And then I'll give like a concrete example of what it could look like. Um, so a meltdown really stems from dysregulation, typically from sensory overstimulation. So it could be a direct trigger, like you hear a blender and then they go into fight or flight. But when the blender stops, which is usually like after 30 seconds, 40 seconds, um, they don't stop crying. They are dysregulated for like minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes after. It might not be a full meltdown, but you can tell they're off, they're irritable, they're moody, they're more clingy. It's a longer lasting effect after the sensory input is gone. And this isn't just for sound, this could be for touch. This could be for movement. Anything that they're sensitive to or having a hard time processing, when you remove that stimulus or that input, or you give them that stimulus or input, if you have a child who's seeking it, um, they don't stop that behavior, that meltdown behavior right away. And they don't stop feeling dysregulated right away versus like a tantrum. Like they would, there's a lot of kids who have, who are not used to loud sounds. It doesn't mean that they have sensory processing challenges, right? Like a child who maybe doesn't like the sound of the blender or it interrupted their iPad game or interrupted their TV. They would cry when it's on, but as soon as it's off, dried tears going back to what they were doing, right? They're not there, there's no lingering like hangover. Um, meltdowns can also stem from anxiety because it is a fight or flight panic. So if you have a child who has anxiety or, um, or feels very anxious, like my daughter has both, um, she gets meltdowns when she's anticipating something or if she's had a long day full of sensory input, um, typically school is one of those or like following a doctor's office. Um, the thing that I think throws off some parents is that meltdowns can happen, um, it, after like a culmination of things, like mm -hmm. after the third day of like Christmas break and there's three days of no routine, oh, sorry, I hit the mic, three days of no routine and a lot of like excitement and a lot of presents and pictures and relatives in the house. And then like, they're gone on Sunday, but like Monday and Tuesday are full of meltdowns. But they were like, well, I didn't turn the blender on today. Why are they having meltdowns? Well, their body is still probably dysregulated from a lot of excitement throughout the days. So it's so not like an them. allergic reaction. It's not like stimulus it's react. Right. Yeah, exactly. Some things it can be, but a lot of the time, actually, um, in real like sensory processing challenge kids, like you'll see, it's just a buildup. And there's some days when they're, they're still processing stuff from two days before, and that's something that even myself, I always have to remind myself, I'm like, we didn't even do anything today. I'm like, well, yesterday she did. And then she probably was so over alert for bed, didn't sleep well. Like there's a whole like domino effect for these kids, right? So those are, those are more meltdowns that um, my daughter still has what I call plain vanilla tantrums. They're still, they're still your typical tantrum. They, they, um, they can still involve screaming, kicking, crying, hitting, saying no, um, but they, they're typically less intense, whether that's duration or like just the intensity of it. Um, and they stop if you give them what they want, mm -hmm. whether it's giving them something or like removing, like I said, removing the sound. Um, uh, a lot of this happens with clothes. A lot of parents think clothing battles are just like child being in control. Sometimes it can be, but if they have a clothing, if they're sensitive to touch and they really, really can't stand the feeling of socks. Um, when you take off the socks that they've just put on, sometimes it'll take a little while for them to readjust if they have sensory challenges. If it's a tantrum and they're just like, 
I don't want to wear socks today, or I don't want to wear clothes today, and you <laughs> let them, um, they will probably stop crying and, and be okay. Um, so the example that I, that I give is, um, so let's talk about like kids playing blocks, right? So um, whether it's in a classroom or siblings and there's two kids playing blocks and um, one child, your child is building, building, building and the other child knocks over the tower. And then this child cries, screams, maybe throws and is very, very angry and upset. A, a non-sensory challenge, a non-anxious child would, that would probably be a tantrum. That would, they would probably last only as long as the other child would say sorry or put the tower back together or an adult would kind of jump in give them a hug. Are you okay? It would five minutes max, maybe. And I, I, I don't love putting time limits because every child is different, but, but that would be like a tantrum. Like he's feeling angry that the child knocked down his tower and he might have a hard time expressing that. Maybe he's only two um, and he got frustrated with that. Um, the same scenario happens, but the child building is a tactile sensitive child and an auditory sensitive child. And when that other uh, boy knocked down the tower, it was a loud crash and some of the blocks touched his body and skin and it was imposed touch, meaning like he wasn't in control of it. So his nervous system mm -hmm. is now ramped up and now he's probably having a meltdown. Um, it's probably a little bit more intense because his brain might have told him he's in danger because again, it's not processing it well and it was startling. So even if you have an adult come in and are you okay, redirect, hug, validate feelings, do all of the things you're supposed to do. And even if that boy takes a break and gives him space and rebuilds it, everything, it's it's gonna take a little while for him to kind of get back to that regulation part of um, which, which takes time. And so this is the part that parents say, well, like what can I do during my child's meltdown? And they never like my answer because it's, you can't really do anything. It, and if you are a parent who experiences meltdowns, you know, this is the case, you know it, but I know you're still out there searching for answers. Cause I did too. Like I read all the books and I'm like, how can I stop my child's meltdown? <laughs> they are not stopping. What is the magic trick? What is the, like, do I count to three? Do I, like, how do I stop this? Like, and you know, you can't, like, you can try everything. You can validate feelings. You can give them what they want. You can take away what they want. You can ignore, you can do whatever you think is going to stop. It's not really going to stop because the only thing that will stop their brain from the dysregulation is to help them get back to regulation. So the best thing you can do is to provide a safe environment that they can do that. And when I say safe, it means allowing them to express that dysregulation in a safe way. So if they're throwing stuff, give them soft things to throw or remove breakable things. Some kids um, want uh, physical touch. Um, and that can be hard as a parent because mm -hmm. Like, I don't like being around my daughter. Like I have my own sensory sensitivities. I uh, recommend every parent invest in a good pair of um, noise reducing headphones or earplugs. I like, there's like a brand called Vibes and there's a brand called Loops, but they're just little inserts that are very discreet. But I honestly carry them like in my pocket all day because it helps me help her through the meltdowns more. So you kind of have to sit through them with that meltdown. Um, if they're needing a hug, hug them. If they're needing you to sit with them, sit with them. But like, this is the time where you like turn off your voice. Like not even, I can't, I'll say like, I love you. I know it's hard. I'm here. And I'll just sit there and like, maybe after like 10 minutes, I'll like repeat it again. But sometimes I'll just let her have her thing. And then at a more neutral time, we'll talk about it and I'll let her know oh, you had a really long day from school. And when you got home, you really wished that I had given you that snack, but I planned a different snack. And it was really hard for you because I think you were, you know, you had a long day at school. What did you do? And I'll talk about it and I'll say, mommy was sitting next to you and holding you really tight because I didn't, I couldn't let you hit me. And I couldn't let you hit your head. If you have a child who has a meltdown with like these big head banging, my daughter used to bite her hand. If they're small enough, uh, you want to try to like restrain them as best as you can to keep them safe. Um, so sometimes 
I have to hold my daughter to keep her safe. And it's not fun. It doesn't stop the meltdown, but like your number one job during a meltdown is to keep them safe and keep you safe. Like your goal cannot be to stop the meltdown or you're going to feel like you're failing every single time. So it's about giving them the tools to like regulate and it's about preventing and giving them the tools to keep themselves regulated before the meltdown starts. Yeah. If you can, but it's going to be unavoidable some days. I mean, like, like myself, like I have every single sensory tool and every structured schedule, but like we still have meltdowns, like you can't avoid it. And I, I want to say providing them the space to get regulated, but during a meltdown, like if you hand them, like, like, let's say they like, like a calm down timer or like a visual thing or a squeeze, if you hand them that in a meltdown more times, they'll like throw it back at you. Like, it's not, I don't hand her anything unless it's like a pillow. Like if she's like throwing me, throwing something at me, I'll like give her a pillow to throw, like without saying anything, but it's not like, okay, take a deep breath. Like they're not going to listen to you when they're in their meltdown their top part of their brain is shut off. And the top part of your brain is where logic, where language comes from, where emotion, like a regulation comes from, where planning and impulse control to tell me to stop hitting something. All of that is like turned off. It's like, sorry, we're not here right now. The bottom part of the brain, the survival mode part of the brain is kicked on because they're overstimulated or they're anxious. So no amount of logic, no amount of emotional validation in that moment will help. And it's literally like, buckle up. We're on this road. There's no exit until your child decides to exit. You know, and I think, I feel like in all these gentle parenting things online, I mean, I follow all these parenting accounts on social media. And I'm sure if you follow me, you probably follow a lot of these too, but you hear like the validate the feelings and the glitter bottles, which by the way, I spent so much time making glitter bottle and all my daughter wanted to do was knock it over because she didn't care in that moment. But you hear like all these things that you're supposed to do. And I just feel like it really alienates people who are struggling with this because that does not always work in a melt or hardly ever work in a meltdown. And yeah, just sometimes like sitting, like where are the accounts that say, sometimes you just have to sit there and let your toddler have their meltdown in your lap. Like nobody, I mean, you do, but like these other accounts don't really talk about that. They talk about the validating and the redirecting and the- And usually it's the ones who are talking about tantrums, but they call them meltdowns. And that's where it gets confusing. And I'll be the first to admit that that stuff shouldn't go out the window. That stuff can help with tantrums. Sometimes it doesn't help with tantrums. But the the part that I work with parents on reframing is the idea of it's not working. And I'm saying, well, your definition of working is you want the meltdown to stop. That can't be a goal. That's not on the menu. You can't order that. We can't have it. It's not here. That's not a goal. You can still do emotional validation and it can work in other ways. Like, well, my child's like outside of meltdowns. Now my child is pointing out other people's emotions. Like she's Mm -hmm. saying, hey, mom, you look like you're really frustrated. That I would say is working. You're building their emotional um, like intelligence and you're building their resilience. And so it's working in other ways, but once parents can understand, okay, meltdowns can't stop tantrums. Sometimes will stop. Sometimes they, uh, if you do something, sometimes they won't, um, if you do something, but they'll last a lot shorter. Um, but you can still start. There's nothing wrong with validating like the first time, like uh, the first half of the meltdown. Oh, that blender was really loud. That was a really loud sound for you, but then I would stop, but don't expect like, okay, I validated the feeling. Why are they still melting down? Like that's That's not, (laughs) yeah, I think. And that's how I was telling people, well, it's not working, but I think where the gap is, is one, those accounts are not always talking about meltdowns, but two, those accounts are not really going further to say, this is what you do in a tantrum or meltdown, but this is not going to stop it, but this is how you should handle it. Like if you are a parent who's wanting to build emotional intelligence and social emotional skills. This is how you handle it as opposed to stop crying. Don't do that. Stop this. Stop that. If you have to say something, validate the feelings, but it's not going to stop the meltdown. And I think that like extended, like little phrase, little disclaimer needs to be on more Instagram posts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think the, the, like, I would be just happier if a lot of accounts would be more, this is a tantrum. This is a meltdown. And where it really comes into play, like I said, at the beginning kind of was like, 
okay, well, a two-year-old having tantrums every day, normal. A two-year-old having meltdowns every single day is, I would say, I, I don't want to say not normal. I would say I would, I would need support at that point as a parent, whether or not you're saying this is this diagnosis or not. I would say go ask for support because that seems a little bit outside of the norm. If they are meltdowns, if they Let's are meltdowns. Let's this support because yeah. I got the support and my daughter was too. And I sought the support of an OT because yeah, she was having these meltdowns like daily. And then I asked yes. my friend about her kids meltdowns. And she said they were like 10 minutes a day, like three times a week. And I was like, okay, I clearly yeah. yes. to, like talk to somebody. About I'm like, well, that is not a meltdown. And there's nothing. And then I feel like that's that narrative can sometimes be spun into like, well, I'm having a harder time than you. You no, have an easy mom life. It's not like, no. it's not pooping on anyone's like hard days. It's just no, like, totally. that is not a tantrum, but like, I get why you wouldn't need to seek support for that. Yeah. That is normal. That is, that will phase out meltdowns daily. Like I, like you said, yours are over an hour. Mine at her worst when she was two, we were having three of them a day, like 90 minutes long. She was like biting her hand. Like I had to cancel work. Like it was very impactful to our day. It was not by any means like normal. And I knew I needed the support. And so I want, I don't want parents to just like and you're like mom groups hearing everyone talk about like their meltdowns, but like, then you not really dig deeper and saying, well, what does your meltdown look like versus mine? And should I be quiet? Should I stop complaining? Because everyone is having meltdowns. Right. Um, and it's not about yeah. a comparison. Like, like you said, a mom comparison, it's just more of like a tool to help you see like, yes, maybe I need to, you know, get some help. Like, filter that first screen. Right. like, well, does it, do I need help or not? Like, right. yeah. So I, and Again, I, I don't like to give out too many time limits because some tantrums can last long be, depending on how you've been responding to them. They might, that's when they can like, uh, just, they can be more putting on a show, I would say, if they know that, that, that they will get you to give them what they need for those tantrums. So some of the tantrums can last long, but meltdowns, like if they're happening like often to the point where it's impact. Like you can't go places. Like you're like canceling plans, canceling work, leaving play dates early, not going to play dates. Um, your child can't like sit through, um, you know, a meal without having a meltdown and they're mm -hmm. lasting like really long or there's self injury. My daughter used to bite her hand, hit her head. Like, um, and it was just so impactful that I'm like, I, I just need help. I need, I need support. And even I took that to my pediatrician, it took me three visits to my own pediatrician who I loved and trusted her with everything but it took me three times to go back and say no I need support I need like this is not normal right. um I think the the last like push for it was I took video so I always tell parents mm -hmm. if you can take video because when you're just saying my two-year-old is kicking and screaming because she doesn't want to eat strawberries they're like oh yeah well there's picky like two-year-old for you and it's like no there's sensory sensitivity. She is having a meltdown. She is like, when you just casually say it, it's not, it's, it's not enough. It sounds very much like a typical two-year-old right. so video. Be objective. Say it lasted 90 minutes. She bit her hand. There's bruising. Um, like as many details as you can um, to really, really drive home the point. And then don't feel shy at the end of the day. If your pediatrician is still not believing it, just say, I really need support. I, I need you to refer me to an OT or to a developmental pediatrician who has more knowledge about like the behavioral and cognitive challenges in that age range. But don't be shy to like really push for it because at the end of the day, there's not it, like, I, I feel like some pediatricians, I'm like, do you have like a limited amount of how many golden ticket referrals you can give to OTs? Like, why are you not just, if a parent is saying it, what is the harm in saying, okay, I'll write you a referral to go get an evaluation. As a but dietitian, as I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, are you only allowed three a month and you're saving them? Like, why is it not just, okay, like, let's just hear this mom right. out and let her have some peace of mind. Let her get it. There is no harm in no. getting that evaluation and ruling things out. I would much rather be wrong than late. Right. Right. 
that so so that's my very passionate sorry if I was screaming no 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 that's good <laughs> I have two more questions for you that I want to fit in before we wrap up though so, yes yes of um, course okay so first is um so this I think of this because in what you've mentioned today and in what other like sensory accounts that I've followed have talked about like sitting through the tantrums and what do you do if you can't sit through the tantrum with your kid like you have an infant who needs to be breastfed and like your toddler is having sensory needs. And then the fact that you can't sit there with them is causing the meltdown or like, you know, that you come home from school and you like have to get dinner on the table. And so you have to be at the stove cooking. And the fact that you can't get the ice pack out of the freezer for them when they want it, that's like the tripwire for the meltdown. So what do you do if you can't like hold them through this 30 minute meltdown? Like, are there other strategies or you just have to sit there and hear it. I mean, I just feel so bad when that happens. I know. And I get a lot of questions about that of moms of multiples and I only have one. So I'm like, I can give you what I think I would do, but it's not always going to be easy. And there's going to be some, like with all things in motherhood, I feel like there's that 80, 20 rule where like you've attempted 80% of the time to like be exactly how you try it. And like 20% of the time, it's not going to be perfect. And that's fine for me. Like that's, that's great. So there, like times like that during dinner, or if you have a really chaotic house and they're having a meltdown, if you have like a calm, uh, calm down corner or like a space that you know that it's not a timeout, let's start that off that way, not put them in their negative. You want it to be a safe space for them. So when I'm doing that, like um, sometimes my husband's like on a work call and she's having a meltdown and I'm doing something um, I will have to calmly like bring her there. And I will say, you can, you can cry and hit and scream here. Like it's a, I know it's a safe place for her. Um, or you can sit with mommy in the kitchen, but there's no, well, we can't scream in the kitchen. If you need to scream, you can go back there. But sometimes again, um, you have to catch them before their full meltdown mm. to be able to give those boundaries. Right. And she, to this point, like now she knows. So if, uh, so it's like a habit, she'll know back room, she can scream and stomp. If you want to be in the kitchen and still be mad and still cry, I'll like put a pillow on the floor or like a chair and like her something. Um, and I'll be able to still like give her like a hug in between or right. something. Um, it's very rare that that happens, but she, uh, she knows that she can go in the back room. The other thing is sometimes when it's very violent and there's a lot of screaming and kicking, um, I put her in her car seat. I put her in the car seat and sometimes I'll sit in the car with her. Sometimes I'm out, obviously like make sure that there's ventilation and like all of those right. safety pieces to it. Um, but sometimes when I can't physically hold her and she's harming herself or me, the car seat is the safest place for her. She can't get out of it yet. So um, that's the trick. I will, um, I'll say you can scream as long as you want in here. Um, but, uh, and I'll say like, I'm putting you here because I, I, I can't be safe anymore. I'm not safe when you're doing this. So she knows when we go down there and she'll have, and I will say again, that doesn't always like help, but it's like my like last resort. I need her to be safe. I need me to be safe. This might extend it because she doesn't love it, but I can't, I can't sit, I can't keep her safe in that moment. Um, so that might be the best option if you have multiple kids, um, putting them in a car seat. Okay. Um, okay. Well, that's a great, this is kind of like a segue into that because so for my daughter, it's just is kind of funny as like a eating behavior, pediatric dietitian, a lot of her meltdowns are around dinner time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think it's a culmination of she's been really overstimulated at school. And then it's just like the tripwire of like, it's just something on her plate that she doesn't want. Um, she does have some like tactile sensory sensitivity issues a little bit. But for parents who like, I want to get your take on this because we see, like, I talk a lot about sensory bins and sensory play and like exposure, like all of these things are really important, but there's a line where like sensory bin is not going to be the, the problem solution or the, is not going to be the solution for somebody with SPD or like, you know, finger painting with colored yogurt great for kids who have tactile issues, but that's not going to be like the solution. <laughs> and so how do you 
as an OT who like actively treats these kiddos, where do you see the line between, yes, like at home working on these sensory bins and exposure activities is really important. And it's a really a key component for all kids who are learning to like new vegetables and fruits, but like, how would you identify that kid who needs to go into feeding therapy with an OT? Yeah. So, so there's like a number that if you list down all of their foods, just in terms of like, is my child just a picky eater or are they a problem field feeder? Do they need therapy? Right. just by right. listing their foods, right? It's right. less than 30 foods. But keep in mind though, I want to add to like foods, like ketchup that counts as a food, right? Like different types of tater tots. Those count as food. It's right. not just like, like I, nuggets. it's not exactly. One. Yeah. So it could be like, like McDonald's chicken nuggets, Carl's Jr. chicken nuggets, exactly. dino nuggets. Those are three different proteins. Right. Right. And, Cause I, like, hear, I say that cause some moms come to me and are like, my kid only eats three foods. But then when we talk about all the different options, yeah. they're, they're like, like oh. 30 <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's usually 10 proteins, 10 starches, and then 10 fruits and vegetables. Um, and again, like a ver- like you could have 10 brands of chicken nuggets and that would count as 10 proteins because the idea is that you don't repeat a certain food too right. often that they food jag or get sick of it. And then they like remove that from their list. Right. But the thing to know, so if you already are listing down your foods, dips, drinks, everything, and how they fit within protein, starches, vegetables, and fruits, and it's still under 30, um, I would seek an evaluation. The, um, the thing that, that is not really always understood about feeding is that it's not just about the taste and smell and like taste smell. The vestibular sense is actually really involved in yeah. eating. And so is, so is, uh, proprioception and, and how your posture is. Um, and the other, and so, so if any one of those parts of your sensory system is inefficient, um, that could lead to that could just be an extra layer that you can't you can't really um an untrained eye if you're not an ot or in the field would not be able to notice that um and those are things that would definitely be need needing to be assessed and addressed in the clinic um and the other thing i'll say with is when we're talking about food pickiness and you are and you know your child has sensory issues and these these things can happen when you're really really young from an inherent sensory sensitivity. Maybe it was a texture when they were like 12 months old, right? Maybe they were constantly wiped down with a washcloth. Right, exactly. Right. Or like you were very like, <laughs> yes, every time they ate and then they're pairing it with that auditory sound. Like there's a lot of things that we don't realize that we do that start off as a sensory based fear of the food. But the more often, like it starts off as a sensory piece, but every time that they have a negative association with the food, whether they gag or they vomit, or if we don't mean to, but it happens and we yell and, and meal times become stressful. Now you're pairing that like learned fear with this like biological um, intolerance of certain foods or textures or tastes. Um, and so you've got now this like learned fear that can start to that can start to um, bleed into the environment. They're fear. They're afraid of the dinner table. Every time they see that chair, they know that they're going to be in there and they're going to have broccoli in front of them. Every time they walk past the kitchen, like there's just like an added layer of learned fear out after having so many negative experiences, which isn't your fault as a parent, but because you have to be eating three times a day, and there's a lot of stress as a caregiver to get your child the foods that they need. Right. So it's really, really hard, but. That's why um, the number one goal I always have for parents is not to drive calories, to drive variety. My number one goal is always to have a healthy relationship around food. So oh my gosh, you to- are just singing, <laughs> singing my song here. <laughs> to be able to sit at a table with different smells, different foods, and it's okay if you are only going to eat the chicken nuggets and ketchup, but if you can sit there regulated, and be okay with mom and dad eating broccoli and the smell of vinegar on someone's salad dressing, and you don't have this inherent anxiety and meltdown, that already is progress. Though they're not biting the broccoli, like there's so much potential for progress when you aren't narrow, when you're not just focused on like, okay, eat vegetables, eat fruit, eat this. It really starts with the regulation at the table. And so building more positive associations with that will start what parents can do at home is start to take away the fear-based part of, of food pickiness um, 
And if you're still having that sensory food pickiness part, um, exposure isn't going to do a, like all of it. You're going to definitely want to seek some, um, whether it's OT sensory integration or if they're having some chewing challenges and swallowing, which could be really impacting the textures, then go see a feeding therapist, a speech therapist. There's a lot of different specialists that will help um, and supplement that your work, that the work you're doing at home. Yes. Yes. I love that. Cause there's like all these activities that I talk about that you talk about that different SLPs or speech language pathologists that I follow talk about. But at the end of the day, there are some kids who just need professional help. Like you could do everything that you see on Instagram. And sometimes you just need to seek out an OT yeah. and it will make your life so much easier Agreed. from, from Agreed. experience, like working, having a kiddo with sensory sensitivity it was like night and day and we're still like working on things with her, but oh my gosh, like first it was night and day when I realized that this wasn't normal and it validated my struggles. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then it was night and day when we started working with our OT just to see her behavior changes. And we're not like, we aren't, aren't still having frequent appointments, but I feel like we have been equipped with the tools from working with her to now I can handle the meltdowns and give her the coping tools and teach her these regulation tools. And it's just made a world of difference. So I yeah. love OT profession. Thank you for what you do. <laughs> of course. Of course. I love OTs to have a little biased, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you have some resources for parents who like, if they're wondering, maybe my kid is struggling with this or they know their kid is struggling with this. So can you tell us what you offer for parents? Yeah, so I have a parent membership. So if you are a parent who has a child with sensory sensitivities, whether it's picky eating, if they have a hard time wearing different clothes, playing with messy textures, loud sounds or busy environments, or even um, cutting your nails, brushing your hair, washing, if they have a small sensory cup, then I have a parent membership and program where I teach you ways to supplement and to um, help at home to start supporting them at home using what I call a just right challenge, where you can start building these very small baby step exposures so that they can be successful daily and start building more positive associations with those things. Um, that's called sensory wise solutions. And if you want to get on the wait list for that, you can at the otbutterfly.com slash wait list. But if you want to start support today, I have a free masterclass that kind of gives you a little introduction to the just right challenge and how you can start uh, start looking at that and start building your own goal and your own ladder, which is what I call it, of little baby steps to whatever goal that you might have in mind. And that's free. And you can go to the otbutterfly.com slash masterclass and get your free ticket there and start watching that today. Cool. Awesome. And you're on Instagram. Can you tell us your handle again? Yes, I am on Instagram. I'm at the OT butterfly. You can DM me. I do question boxes once a week. If you ever have questions there or always um, any comments on my posts, I will try to get to and, and answer them there. Okay. And is that the best place for someone to contact you if they wanted to reach out? Yeah. Yeah. I have an email. You can reach me at Laura Pettix at the OT butterfly.com, but Instagram is really where I'm like hanging out way too much, but I will, I I'm, I'm on there daily. <laughs> okay. Well, this was so fun. I told you that I was going to try to keep it shorter than an hour and that did not happen because <laughs> this was so interesting. Like I just could talk about this all day long too, from a professional yeah. perspective, working with picky eating, but also as yeah. a mom, as like a mom. I just want other moms to know all about what you teach so they don't have to feel like they're going crazy or a, they're a bad bomb because they can't handle these meltdowns. I know. And I really, really love spreading that message because that's really the goal. Because when I hear moms like, oh my God, I didn't realize that this, oh, someone could help with this. Like I thought mm -hmm. I was supposed to just like handle this. And I'm like, no, you can get help. So right. thank you for inviting me on here to be able to speak on your platform and just talk about the things that I love. Yeah. Well, and like I could talk about this at length. Like, <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Thank you for having me, Taylor. I'll see you guys around. All right.